Hey friends, let's talk about social hierarchies for a bit. Now, this is a fraught topic and it shouldn't be. Of course there are hierarchies, of course there are patterns of dominance and submission. If there's some pattern of social interaction you can imagine, you can find examples of it. So why are so many people getting enthused about a single simplistic pattern of linear social dominance hierarchies. It happens, it's real, but it's not the only way you can organize a population. I'm going to speculate that one reason is that dominance hierarchies have cropped up repeatedly in human history, so it's familiar. It's also a really simple scheme. I've said before that the dominance hierarchy is a failure mode of more complex patterns of organization. For example, the American system of government has been fairly complex and a bit unwieldy because it's built around multiple sources of authority, a network rather than a straightforward hierarchy. And the worst thing that could happen is if it falls apart into an autocracy built around a strong man at the top and a cascading series of layers of authority. But it's happened before. The god kings of the ancient world, for instance, the Roman Empire, the medieval world. The social pyramid emerges all the time, and it's rarely a good thing since it leads to gross inequity and also long-term instability, since it relies so much on the capabilities of one or a few individuals at the top. It may last a long time, but there will be all kinds of wobbles up and down throughout its history. But now there are people who even now think that returning to a monarchy in which everyone knows their place in the hierarchy would be a good thing. See, for instance, the Dark Enlightenment. So where does this social pyramid come from? I think it's because humans have gotten good at cultivating resource surpluses, and some individuals are better at concentrating those sur surpluses in their hands. Unless we resist as a culture, we end up with that surplus, that wealth, concentrated in the hands of a few. Now note, this is not just capitalism, it predates capitalism. Capitalism is simply one of the more recent tools used to scrape more than their share of resources to themselves. Other tools have included, for instance, land ownership, hereditary aristocracies, and of course, that old bad boy, religion. Now, a pyramid of resources is not all bad. So one of the things people at the top can do is use their excesses to pay for luxuries, like priests and poets and philosophers, and that includes a subset of philosophers called scientists. I like poets and philosophers, at least, so I'm glad this social construct includes space for them. But also note, the purposes of these nice benefits of poets and philosophers, to the king at least, are to instruct all layers of the pyramid that this arrangement is true and right, that it is natural. We hear that so much, that the natural mechanism is the best mechanism. They also want to assure us that this truly is the best of all possible worlds, so don't rock the boat. Don't upend the natural order of things. It will only get worse for you if you cast down the king or dispossess the billionaires. What makes this pyramid stable is that the peons at the bottom are trained to believe that things will get worse for them if they do revolt. So those poets and philosophers have both incentives to defend the system and a predisposition to favor it because they've also been trained in it. It's not necessarily nefarious to argue for a particular hierarchical view of the world. If it's all you've ever known, and if it directly benefits you, it's also entirely natural to want to defend your entitlements. Here's a classic example of this bias, the idea of alpha and beta wolves. Again, I say there's nothing nefarious about this model. Uh, it emerged naturally from observations in the 1940s 
Uh, but it does reflect conventional assumptions coded into our head by our social environment. In the 1940s, Schenkel came up with some descriptions of the behavior of wolves in captivity that were later amplified and popularized by a fellow named Mech, who later rejected that earlier model, so let's give him credit for that, and has since been modified to an even worse caricature by people with a naive agenda. This false model suggested that there was something called the alpha wolf, the top dog, the big boss of the pack, who used social dominance to force the beta wolves to submit to him. The idea is that there is a linear dominance hierarchy. One wolf wins, and the fruits of victory are that the alpha male gets sexual access to the female or females. The females are seen as pawns or trophies to be won in this vulgar reduction of the original idea, although Schenkel and Mech also describe parallel dominance hierarchies within female wolves. You can see why this picture of wolf society was popular. It reinforces the natural order of the status quo. It says that those at the top earned their place through aggression and competition, and it acts as a goad to give the lower ranks incentive to persevere. Stand up straight, throw your shoulders back, take some pride in yourself, and maybe your show of dominance will give you the reward of mating with desirable females. And oh yes, you will deserve that coupling. The only problem with this pattern is that it's wrong. It's not that there is no social dominance or dominance displays, there certainly is, but that the relationship was far more complex. A pack was a family unit. Those beta wolves were actually the mommy and daddy wolves' offspring. And that wasn't just dominance, it was also responsibility and teaching. Furthermore, that relationship is more about cooperation because the pack is a cooperative hunting group. And then the females aren't just token prizes, they're also an important part of hunting and defense. And this is a reciprocal cooperative relationship as well. The female's relationship to the so-called beta wolves also gets more complicated. They're not about romance and mating because this is more of a mother-child deal, but yeah, they all have to work together. And then it gets even more complicated. Uh, the life of a wolf is not all about social striving. There is the struggle to get food. There is coping with a hostile environment. There are things trying to kill you. There is disease. There are parasites. It's a harsh world, and the way to get ahead is not simply intraspecific competition, but cooperation. Read your Kropotkin if you want to learn more about this. Now I know you want the simplicity of just one arrow in this diagram, don't you? You want your simple linear social dominance hierarchy back. You don't get it. Our purpose here is to attempt to map reality, not jigger it to suit your preconceptions. And reality, especially biological reality, is a complex mess. Another important aspect of this greater complexity is that it makes all the players active agents with equally important roles in the social order. In particular, it restores the concept of mate choice and selection to females. They're not just pawns in the social dominance game, but are fully enabled participants. This tends to spark resentment in patriarchal societies where the males might prefer that the competition be restricted to one dimension with other males and are not pleased to learn that all of their striving against their fellows might not be automatically rewarded, but require further exertion along a whole different axis. Oh, and not even the competition with males is simple. There are alternative strategies and trade-offs all over the place. One of my favorite examples is described in Cuttlefish. Here's the scene. A large consort male, marked with a C, is guarding a small female, labeled F. In this picture, he's threatening a large male approaching from the top right by flaring his white arms at him. Meanwhile, another smaller male, labeled M, is approaching from the bottom left. 
the consort male is unconcerned about this invasion because the small male is flashing a female color pattern. He's a sneaker male. In this next scene, the consort is still glaring at the large male, but the sneaker male has actually begun copulating with the willing female. And finally, after the threatening male is left, the consort male calmly and apparently obliviously presides over his ongoing cuckolding, perhaps he thinks he now has two females in his harem, and another male on the far right has joined the queue by putting on female coloration too. Now perhaps you think this is terribly unfair. The consort male is working hard to maintain exclusive access to a stable of females, and this sneaker male, even the name implies some kind of underhanded deviousness, just waltzes in in feminine disguise and impregnates his mate right under his arms. But honestly, if you're going to accept examples of simple dominance hierarchies as evidence that that behavior is right and natural, then you have to accept that this alternative strategy of bi bypassing the whole social dominance rat race is equally right and natural. And we can even, from our human perspective, think of it as commendable. The com consort males are forcing females to mate with them. They are restricting the choices of the females. The sneaker males are not forcing anything on the females, but merely providing a choice, which the female can accept or reject. And they often accept. On the order of a third of the conceptions in these cuttlefish are from the sneaker males. And these aren't even exceptions. We find examples of these alternative strategies all over the animal kingdom. For instance, there are races where there are males that develop female coloration patterns and therefore can mate with the females right under the watchful eye of the aggressively colored male races. Another of my favorite examples are dung beetles of the genus Anthophagus. They've carried out this consort male, sneaker male dichotomy to a biological extreme. These, in this figure, are both males. The major male has a massive horn protruding from his thorax. He uses this in wrestling matches with other major males when he's guarding the entrance to his burrow and to his female trapped inside. The minor male, you may notice, only has a small bump, no horn. He's no good at wrestling but he is very good at slipping past the major male and entering his burrow to canoodle with his female. And this, by the way, is one of those lovely females. The system works just like that of the cuttlefish, but there's another twist. When the minor males fail to develop a large horn, they use the energy they save to build much larger testes. While the large horn major males have smaller testes. This sounds like a stereotype from human behavior as well. Anyway, the minor male delivers much more sperm to the female, so there's also an interesting aspect of sperm competition going on here. But there's another cool aspect to this story, though. It can be experimentally manipulated. The horn grows from a small patch of cuticular tissue in the pupa, and likewise, the testes grow from a different small patch of the tissue at the back end of the pupa. You can go into this pupa at the appropriate time and using a hot needle, cauterize or ext extirpate the horn primordium. And unsurprisingly, at eclosion, you get a beetle with no horn. But perhaps surprisingly, much larger testes. Conversely, if you go in with a needle and destroy the testis primordium, you get a beetle with a much larger horn. Not that it does as much good, since he's sterile. He's really good at wrestling away beetles trying to invade his burrow, uh, but he's unable to fertilize any of his females. There's a trade-off between these two traits. You can be a big bruiser with a massive horn, or you can be a sneaky little guy with big balls, 
and both are viable evolutionary strategies. And don't forget the females. They get to choose whether to be romanced by the small horn males at the expense of the major males, and they do often accept. It's not a simple dominance hierarchy at all, but more of a three-way circular decision tree. Best example, think of games like rock, paper, scissors. That's a more complex game in which the winning choice depends on what the other player decides. And this is what we're seeing just in a bug, or a mollusk, or a fish. When you get up to organisms like humans, which have a much more complex, flexible behavioral repertoire, it's more like playing rock, paper, scissors, lizard, Spock. Now, I said there were lots of other possibilities out there than just simple dominance hierarchies. If you're interested in the complexity of social interactions, I have to recommend this book by Richard Prum, The Evolution of Beauty. It's all about birds rather than beetles, or beetle, or cuttlefish, or fish, but it's still pretty cool. And bird mating strategies are impressively diverse. One theme of the book is the importance of mate choice and sexual selection, and he definitely makes it clear that this is a two-way street. Males are, and females are cooperative interactors in this whole process, and looking at it only from one perspective, from one sex or the other, means you miss 90% of the details. Another point is the importance of aesthetic evolution. We don't give enough credit to the importance of art and beauty in evolution. We tend to reduce it all to brute calculations that individuals will rationally choose mates on the basis of how many calories or how many dollars they can bring to the relationship. Brum argues that sometimes, no, cooperation is built on mutual interest in aesthetic properties. That a bird will choose a mate because they like them, or love how pretty their bower is, or because they're a great dancer, rather than because they've carried out a deep transactional analysis and estimate that they'll deliver a beneficial infusion of bugs. Okay, so think about this all. The, what we're talking about here is that there are multidimensional properties that influence the behavior of organisms that you cannot reduce all of the interactions to a simple linear pattern of social dominance just because you happen to like that particular pattern. That there are a great many other patterns out there as well. That in sexual and that in sexual behavior, it's not just a matter of males making their decisions, that females also have a great deal of influence and make choice and should not be neglected in your analysis. Okay, we'll talk to you next week. Thanks.